Hi everyone. The last time I was on this stage, I shared with you my personal concern about the lack of financial literacy and education among my generation. During our TEDx showcase earlier this year in January, I received a question from one of my teachers asking, and I paraphrase, is financial literacy for the privileged? While I was able to provide an answer at the time, it was vague and it barely scratched the surface. I honestly don't think I truly understood the extent of the question. I found myself thinking further about the question asked and whether or not I had in fact provided a sufficient answer. I questioned the definition of privilege, the involvement of race and gender, as well as the societal institutions that I have grown up participating in. This past year has definitely been one for the history books, with a global pandemic coinciding with an election year. We geared up on toilet paper, food, and supplies as we prepared to shelter in place, but we also mentally prepared ourselves for the variety of situations that could have potentially emerged from the transfer of power at the highest office in America during a state of national emergency. But that was not all we saw this year. We witnessed millions of African Americans and allies marching and protesting in the street on behalf of the Black Lives Matter movement, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and the countless other black and valuable lives lost as a result of police brutality. As I watched these events unfold, I came across the words of former President Barack Obama on Instagram, where he had said that if we want American society at large to operate on a higher ethical code, then we must model that code ourselves. I found myself at the same precipice with the same question, and that is why I'm here again today. If we truly want to create change in a sustainable manner, then we have to investigate and address the problem at hand. After thorough reflection and research, I realized that financial literacy is not accessible to minority populations. Thus, it perpetuates a system of racial and gender discrimination. I would like to begin by setting the stage with some important statistics to keep in mind. A 2019 census found that the United States witnessed historic lows in poverty rates since 1959, with only 10.5% of the population living in poverty. Now, at first glance, that seems like a small number. However, that is around 33 million people. In addition, African American and Hispanic populations also reported lows as well, with 18.8%, or 6 million, and 15.5%, or 5 million people living in poverty respectively. Let's think about that for a minute. If 5 to 6 million people is considered a low for these demographics, what constitutes a high? Also, why are these numbers the reality? Well, according to a gender wage gap study conducted in 2019, women earned 81.5% of what men earned. As we examine the disparity through the lens of race, we see that colored women earn less than white women in comparison to men, and therefore, Latinas and African American women reported 62% and 68% respectively. Data also indicates that men of color earn less than white men, therefore, our wealth hierarchy becomes white men at the top, followed by men of color, followed by white women, and at the very bottom, women of color. This concerns me. As a young woman of color, having to enter the competitive workforce, understanding my predisposed disadvantages is extremely nerve-wracking and scary. This is the product of our current system. In my previous talk, I discussed the ongoing epidemic of low financial literacy rates among my generation. And according to the National Financial Capability Study drafted in 2018, Respondents aged 18 to 34 reported the highest levels of stress and anxiety when discussing or considering their finances. Such a sentiment is further emphasized in respect to gender, with single women reporting higher levels in both categories as compared to their single male counterparts. Where is this stress coming from, you may ask? The same study continued to report that men find it easier to make ends meet in comparison to women. In addition, when asked if they would be able to arrange a sum of $2,000 in their current circumstances, the capability study found that women were more likely than men to struggle with covering unexpected expenses. Factoring in race once more, 
it is found that African American and Hispanic populations are more likely to have difficulty in such scenarios. I understand that that was a lot of information to process all at once, but that was just a tiny fraction of what I read in the almost 50-page documents. Through simulating different scenarios and aspects, such as medical insurance, access to government aid, marital status, and age, the study consistently found that women were more likely to struggle in comparison to men, and even more so for women of color. These statistics are a direct result of the gap in financial literacy that exists in America between men, women, and people of color. At this point, you may be wondering, how exactly did this gap come about? Historically, women across the globe were recognized as inferior dependents of men whose only duties were to reproduce, complete household chores, and take care of the children. According to a research analysis conducted by Harvard professor Claudia Golden, it wasn't until the early 1900s that the United States witnessed women even enter the workforce. And even then, it was just single women and African-American women taking on domestic employment. Although more colored women during that era worked in comparison to white women, financial responsibility still rested with the men. The 20th century also brought drastic social changes with the rise of the suffragette movement and the civil rights movement, paving the way for an equal, modernized 21st century. As more and more women and people of color gained access to their rights, they were able to integrate into educational and workplace environments. However, this did not come easily, given that the United States had followed a strict patriarchy for centuries. And therefore, many women and people of color were subject to harsh backlash. If we analyze America's deep history with people of color, specifically African Americans, we see a long history of enslavement, followed by a period of segregation, and even still, a lack of acknowledgement for civil rights. Ultimately, all of this led to the dehumanization of an entire population. So when a population's main focus becomes gaining recognition as a human being, other priorities, such as financial literacy, take the backseat. In a society that consistently tries to keep them in a lower socioeconomic position through tactics such as redlining or separate but equal, it is not surprising that people of color make up the majority of people living close to or below the poverty line. Finally, the situation is further exacerbated within our society that equates hard work with success and poverty with laziness, ultimately patting themselves on the back for the few success stories that manage to break the pattern. With minority groups working hard to achieve their basic human rights, it meant that financial education became a privilege to those who had the time, the money, and the right qualifications. If you were part of the privileged community whose parents had the time to educate you, as opposed to the low-income communities whose parents focused on making ends meet, financial literacy was way more accessible. Unfortunately, as data indicates, low-income families were generally comprised of minority populations. As I reflect on my own experience as a woman of color in respect to finance, I am quite concerned. After my own extensive research and even developing a course, I found that in some areas, I still fall within the statistics. For example, as I mentioned in my last talk, I have been driving now for almost a year and a half. Generally, every so often, one has to take their car in for oil changes, engine checks, and just to make sure that everything is functioning properly. And if there is one thing that I am completely clueless about, it would be the workings of my car. Therefore, whenever I discuss plans, charges, and invoices after my appointments, I heavily rely on my dad. Even as I wrote this part, I had to double check the terminology that I was using was correct. So. That just gives you a bit of a scale. So, not surprisingly, I tend to feel an unreasonable amount of anxiety. Why is this? After observing and comparing an experience with and without my dad, I notice two things. First, when auto workers see my dad, they become more serious, direct, and honest in regards to next steps, if any. When they see me alone, they tend to use a lot of vague auto jargon, which I cannot understand, and there are normally so many things that I need to account for on the paperwork and bills. Now, some may say that this is because of my age and that I lack awareness, 
but I have noticed the same things with my female peers. The point is, service agents believe that women are less astute in respect to cars and therefore are easier targets to additional charges. And in my case, they aren't wrong to think that. I am completely clueless. So how does this have to do with the topic at hand? The car example was just one of many, where women are assumed to be inferior in intellect to men because of stereotypes. But in many cases, like that of myself, the generalization is not exactly based on a misconception. Like I shared before, women have generally held domestic and passive roles within society up until recently. Therefore, we haven't had that much experience in these institutions that were built to work with men. The same is true for people of color. Now, of course, the basic financial literacy that I proposed in my last talk is clearly not sufficient enough to help us deal with these tasks. But speaking from experience, when I dove into the world of financial literacy and economics, I quickly realized how little I knew and how much it could help me in the future. Financial literacy is addictive. And as you start to learn, you constantly look for more and more information to better yourself. Well, why can I say this? Because from my daily observations, there are two conclusions that I have made about people. First, everyone wants to be successful in their own path. And second, everyone wants to be able to support themselves and or their families in the future. Financial literacy accomplishes both. In my last TEDx, I shared why financial education is significant to the development of our generation, the obstacles preventing it from being taught, as well as how the ongoing pandemic served as a painful piece of evidence as to why literacy is so crucial. A recent Charles Schwab financial literacy survey found that 89% of Americans agree that the lack of financial education contributes to some of the biggest problems that our country faces, including poverty, lack of job opportunities, unemployment, and even wealth inequality. Said social justice issues are direct factors disproportionately affecting minority communities, thus perpetuating the disparities that our current foundations are built upon. If a majority of us can agree that financial acumen is the solution to some of the country's most polarizing issues, then we must move to take action. So now it's time to think, what can you do? Well, if you're a student or a teacher or a parent or just someone who wants to know more about personal finance, start a conversation with those closest to you. We need to eradicate the stigma behind discussing money. Money can no longer be this taboo topic because what is better, sending your loved one into the world unprepared or sitting them down, having that conversation, and then knowing that they'll be set down a path of success. If we have seen anything from this past year of pandemics, social awareness that impelled action, and the election, uncomfortable conversations are being started across the media and our country. So I think it's time that we do the same for this field as well. Although today we are witnessing a shift in many corporate cultures where many organizations commit to respecting all employees as equal with efforts to enable women and minorities to succeed and advance their careers, success cannot be achieved if these groups do not get the necessary support. Women have been groomed into submission through societal expectations, as well as people of color, and they carry that into the workplace as they do not question the male bravado of their coworkers, compensation, or recognition, if any. If the environment is not conducive to advocacy, how are minorities taught to be confident in, de in their decisions? Same goes for finances. If minorities and women don't have sufficient education, how can they confidently approach these life changes decisions. For this reason, to reduce the gaps and ensure that financial literacy is not just a privilege for the select few, I reiterate, this much needed education has to be taught among the core subjects in school. Thank you for listening to my TEDx.